Hey, happy birthday. Okay, so uh, all sergeants, please start your recording. PC recording has been set. Well recording, good. Sergeant Leonardo, you may begin with your opening statement. Good morning and welcome to the New York City Remote Council hearing for the Committee on Finance. At this time, we ask that all council members and staff please turn on their video for verification purposes. To minimize disruptions throughout the hearing, please place all cell phones to silent or vibrate. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so via email by sending it to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that is testimony at council.nyc.gov. We thank you for your cooperation. Mr. Chair, we're ready to begin. Thank you very much. And my name is Daniel Drum and I'm the chair of the Finance Committee. Uh, welcome to everyone. Today we are joined by council members Adams, Lewis, Koslowitz, Mario, Rodenchik, uh, Amphrey Samuel, and I think others will be joining us shortly uh, as well. Um, today, the committee, today the committee is holding an oversight hearing on the independent budget officer's evaluation of the New York City Industrial Development Agency's industrial program. The evaluation was conducted pursuant to Local Law 18 of 2017, which, was, which the council passed in order to create a formal process for the evaluation of the city's economic development tax expenditures with evaluations conducted by the New York City Independent Budget Office. Local Law 18 was the outcome of the recommendations made by the New York City Council Task Force on Economic Development and Tax Expenditures. Between January 2015 and September 2016, the task force explored how the council could improve its oversight of New York City's economic development tax expenditures and provide a systematic process for evaluating tax expenditures in order to help the public and lawmakers better understand the impact of these tax breaks. In general, tax expenditures, commonly referred to as tax breaks, are revenue losses that result from a special exclusion or deduction given to specific taxpayers that exempt them from paying a tax they would otherwise have to pay. Tax expenditures make up a large portion of city spending with nearly $7.2 billion in tax breaks given out in fiscal 2021 alone and are used as a substitute for direct spending to achieve similar goals. Nonetheless, until Local Law 18, tax expenditures have not been subject to the same kind of oversight as other parts of the budget. With the passage of that law, however, the city became the first municipality in the nation to adopt a systemized tax expenditure review process and bring stronger accountability to these expenditures. The council in collaboration with IBO selected IBA's industrial program as the second evaluation by IBO under the local law. Briefly, IDA's industrial program was established in 1974 to promote the economic welfare of the city's inhabitants and to promote, attract and encourage and develop an economically sound commerce and industry for the purpose of preventing unemployment and economic deterioration. To accomplish the agency's goals, IDA's powers allowed it to provide various types of financial incentives to firms such as real property tax exemptions or abatements sales tax exemptions on purchases of construction materials and mortgage recording tax exemptions. IDA has also has the ability to enter into agreements requiring payments in lieu of taxes or pilots and can provide grants or loans to certain businesses and entities. In fiscal 2020, there were 195 active industrial incentive projects with a total project amount of $2.4 billion and the total city cost net of recapture and penalties was 37.4 million. Today, of course my dogs start barking, pardon me. We will now hear testimony 
from George Sweeting and Elizabeth Brown from the Independent Budget Office, followed by testimony from XYZ of the, uh, from the New York City Industrial Development Agency. I will now turn it over to our committee council for a few procedural items and to swear in the witnesses. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, I'm Stephanie Ruiz, Council to the City's Council Committee on Finance. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you're called on to testify, at which point you'll be unmuted by the Zoom host. I'll be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called as I'll periodically announce who the next panelist will be. We'll first hear testimony from the administration, which will then be followed by questions from the council members, followed by testimony from members of the public. I will now minister the oath. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Mr. George Sweeting? Yes. Ms. Elizabeth Brown? Yes. Mr. Krishna Amalade? Yes. And Mr. Vaughn Singletary? Yes. Thank you. Um, IBO, you may begin on ready. Um, I'll just quickly say uh, uh, thank you for the invitation to testify and present the, the results of this evaluation. Um, this is a process, a collaborative process between IBO and the council. Uh, this is the second report we've done. And uh, we're looking forward to continuing to, uh, to do some of these in the future. Um, we'll one of the topics I think we'll bring up today is some suggestions on ways that would make it easier for us to do a more comprehensive analysis of uh, some of the other projects that uh, some of the other programs that uh, right now are difficult for us to, to take a look at. Uh, and uh, with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Elizabeth Brown, who uh, did the, this evaluation and will present her findings. Thank you. Okay, just making sure this. Just wanna make sure, Rebecca, do I have control of your? Yeah. Yes, okay. Oh. Okay, thank you. Thank you for so much for the opportunity to testify today. Um, I'll be presenting an overview of our findings or evaluation of the IDA's industrial program in a forthcoming final report, we'll have a lot more details on these findings and also our analysis and the program. So as was mentioned, um, I'm just gonna give a little overview of the industrial program. It, it provides tax incentives to lower the cost of constructing, renovating and owning industrial facilities in New York City. In fiscal year 2019, which is the last fiscal year of our analysis, the cost to the city was around 31.5 million and around 200 projects were benefiting in that year. I wanna talk a little bit about the history of the program and its creation um, as it relates to the goals of the program. And for, this is how we'll be evaluating the program obviously against those goals. So for many years, the main way that the IDA provided tax incentives and low cost financing to keep industrial firms and other firms in New York City was through bond financing. And with this bond financing came tax incentives that were mentioned earlier, prop discounts on property tax, uh, discounts on mortgage recording tax and sales tax benefits. Um, during the Giuliani administration in the mid nineties, there was some discussion both in the Giuliani administration and in the IDA that um, the economic development programs of the city were not necessarily meeting or reaching smaller and mid-sized businesses. Um, so in 19, late 1994, the IDA created a new way of financing for firms to receive benefits without uh, taxes and bonds because the issuance of those bonds can be fairly costly and time consuming and was harder for smaller businesses um, to access. And what this program was called was a straight lease program. And the way it worked is the IDA would take nominal ownership of an industrial or another firm's property and then lease it back to the firm. And because the IDA now owns the property, they're at, the firm is eligible for the mortgage recording tax, sales tax, and property tax benefits of the IDA. Um, so a few months later in early 1995, the Giuliani administration with the IDA announced what they called the straight lease program for industrial projects, 
which would become known as the industrial program. Um, and this happened at a time when the city was continuing to lose its manufacturing jobs between 1990 and 1995, when it was announced, the city had lost 21% of its manufacturing jobs. And again, this program was framed as um, targeting small and mid-sized businesses. And so when we look back through press releases and sort of an initial program description, we wanted to see what the goals of the program were when it was created in the mid nineties. And really the goal was that of the IDA, according to the, the, the announcement of the program, which was to promote and assist private sector development and to thereby advance job opportunities and the economic welfare to the people of New York City. Um, 26 years have passed. I can we go back? I don't. Well, 26 years have passed um, since the creation of the industrial program, industrial program, and it's um, there's been several mayoral administrations. So we wanted to make sure that the goals of the program um, were still in line with the, you know, the, were they any different than when they were created? And so to look at the current goals of the program, we looked at the IDA's UTEP. That's the Uniform Tax Exemption Policy, and it is a um, a document that is required of all IDAs across the state. Um, they, um, they it's sort of a basic guidelines of how the IDA should work and what their programs are, their eligibility, et cetera. And so there have been a few versions of the UTEP since the program, um, since the UTEP started and the most recent was released in 2017. And in this version, unlike prior versions, for each of the IDA's programs, there was a policy um, objective. And the policy objective uh, for the, the industrial program, let me get back to it. Um, um, I had it on the screen, but I'm going to read it to you right now um, as it's the current goal. So it, the IDA recognizes the importance of the industrial, industrial sector by virtue of the sector's ability to create living wage job opportunities. By preserving, enhancing, and building industrial space, the agency can diversify the city economy, support immense manufacturers, incentivize and spark innovation, and create pathways to the middle class for city residents, with the goal of maximizing job creation relative to the amount of the financial assistance provided. So it's a lot more detailed um, than that goal, maybe from 1995, but in essence, has uh, you know is similar. Um, there's the, 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 the creation of living wage job opportunities, which is the you know, living wage is the hallmark of the de Blasio administration. Um, and when we were putting this analysis together, we talked to staff of the IDA who said they really saw the program as one of a preservation of industrial space. There's limited industrial space in the city. This program encouraged capital, encourages capital investment in that limited industrial space for industrial uses and jobs, et cetera. Sure, I'm actually moving this myself. Um, so, how do firms get into the program? I want to talk a little bit about who's eligible. So, all of the programs in the IDA are discretionary, which means firms must apply and be approved by the IDA board. Um, there are some basic pro uh, eligibility requirements, however, before you can apply, and I have them up here. Um, firms must be acquiring, constructing, or substantially rehabbing facilities for an industrial use. What's an industrial use? It's manufacturing, assembling, processing, et cetera, of, a, of tangible property. During the life of the program, the creation of an intangible asset was added as that became more of a thing. Um, most of the projects re receiving assistance through this program are owner occupied, which means it's an industrial firm um, constructing or rehabbing a space for itself. Um, over the life of the program, the benefits available to developers of industrial space, where the, where the tenant would be the industrial firm, ha have expanded early in the program's history. Only, um, your own developers were only eligible in certain areas of the city and not for the full complement of benefits. Currently, developers anywhere in the city are eligible and for all the benefits um, allowed. There is a minimum capital investment required. That is the greater of $1 million or 15% of the combined assessed valuation of the land and building at the time the, the assistance is awarded. So how does it work? Who gets there? Let's talk a little bit who gets in and how they find out about the program. Um, so in talking with the IDA and some of the beneficiaries who receive assistance from the program, we learned that most firms that enter the program find out about it through what they call an IDA consultant. And these are often former IDA employees that work with the real estate industry to publicize the program and to help firms apply for a fee. Um, 
what might happen is a firm is looking for a new space and they are meeting with you know, a real estate, a lender or a lawyer, and they say, okay, there might be some city tax incentives available to you to help you afford um, this new space. And they refer them to the consultant. The consultant then assesses the eligibility for the program or other programs. Um, and then if they feel like they're eligible and likely to actually receive assistance, they'll meet with the IDA staff for another um, sort of assessment of eligibility. And if the IDA staff believes that the board would be likely to approve, they're eligible and likely to approve, um, the assistance, they'll, they'll invite the applicant, the, the firm to submit an application. And so what is the IDA board looking for in an application? Well, this is outlined in the UTEP as well, that guiding document. And there are a few criteria that they are, are supposed to consider. The first is inducement, that the project would not go forward without the help of the IDA. So it might, you know, a firm might have to move to New Jersey, the, the, the space would be unaffordable, for example, um, or it happened to a lesser extent. Um, they also consider the size of the capital investment the firm would be making, the job goals. So firms that apply for assistance from the IDA have to set a job creation goal for three years after their project is complete. Um, the industry of the firm, the IDA staff also does a cost benefit analysis to the city, which is also considered. Um, if, the, if the application is approved and benefits are awarded, it's all, all of the details of the deal are um, put together in the lease agreement. A lot of the deals, most of the deals are approved because there is this vetting process that happens before application. One of the benefits of the program, we mentioned these earlier, there's sales tax exemption on construction materials, property tax savings through discounted payments in lieu of property taxes that last 25 years. There is a phase out at the end, but that is often the biggest benefit to the firm and a waiver of mortgage recording tax. There are some strings that come with these benefits. Um, Assistance from the IDA, including assistance under the industrial program, is subject to recapture um, in the first 10, usually the first 10 years of benefits. So what that means, if the, is, if the firm, there's some sort of adverse event, they call it a recapture event, that takes place within the first 10 years, the IDA will terminate the assistance and the firm will have to repay the assistance they already received with interest. Um, some of these recapture events might be selling the facility, for example, within the first 10 year of benefits, over subleasing the site, so it's supposed to be an owner occupied site and they rent it out to tenants, et cetera. Um, there is also some compliance and reporting um, that's required. One I wanna mention here is each, um, each year, firms that are receiving assistance through the IDA and through this program of the IDA are required to submit what they call employee benefit reports. And this has data on the number of employees, their wages and benefits at all of the project locations. Um, and then the IDA uses this data for their own required reporting under local law and state law. And I mention this because these are things that are not recapture and this, this sort of compliance and reporting are things that are not necessarily required of other city tax incentives. So I wanna talk a little bit about the data and methodology we use for our evaluation. Um, we have several sources of data. The first is the IDA. They were able to provide us with a lot of data, including at least basic data on all of the projects that we received assistance through the program from when it began through the end of calendar year 2019 when they delivered the data to us. When I say basic data, I mean uh, the name of the project, its location, and its start and, and start and end dates for benefits. For projects that were active in the program from fiscal year 2006 forward, they were able to provide um, a lot more detailed data. And when I say active from 2006 forward, at fiscal year 2006 forward, I mean as, as long as they were receiving benefits in those years. So they may have started receiving benefits earlier, but if they were still receiving it in fiscal year 2006, we were able to receive more detailed data, which include, included taxpayer ID numbers, final cost budgets for their capital projects, their job creation goals that they set at application, mortgage recording tax and sales tax waiver amounts, and some other data. Um, the data on employment and wages that they collect through their employee benefits report was also available to us. Um, that's because it's um, made public under local law. Um, data on employment and wages is important for this analysis, but we chose not to use that um, for a number of reasons. One being IBO has attempted to use that data in the past and found it inconsistent, um, both among firms. So some firms might include tenants in their employments, while other firms might not, for example. And there's been changes to what's been required over time. Um, the city council has amended the legislation that requires those employee benefit reports several times to try to fix some of those inconsistencies. And I do think they, the data has become more consistent as time goes on, but because we wanted to go back, we wanted to use a, a more independent source of data. 
And we have access to the quarterly census of employment and wages, um, which is employment data through the, Depart the New York State Department of Labor. And this is employment data, this data is um, data on the employment and wages of any firm in New York City that has to pay into the unemployment insurance system. Um, and we have that data going back from 2000 to, 2000 to 2018. And what that allowed us to do is for those firms who received detailed data on their taxpayer ID, we could create a database um, on those firms' employment from 2000 to 2018. So any firm that received assistance from 2000 forward, we could look to see, okay, um, you know, are they creating these living wage jobs? And we could track employment um, and wages before, for some firms before, when they receive benefit, and then after they receive benefit. We could also use the, that data to compare um, the employment, they, the jobs they create to their goal. Um, they set an application, were they meeting those goals? And we also use the QCW data, the employment data, to look at what was happening in, this, in the city's employment in those sectors that are impacted by the program writ large to sort of provide some perspective to what was going on. Um, one of the things that we don't have in this analysis that is a limitation is a comparison group. So ideally, when you're doing an analysis like this, you would have a, a group of assisted firms and a group of unassisted firms that are very similar and could compare the outcomes between them both to see what was the, the isolate the impact of the program. Um, we were limited in our data to create a comparison group. Um, our first idea was to use rejected applications. So firms that were eligible for the program, interested in the program, but for some reason did not receive assistance. Um, as I described earlier, the sort of vetting process that happens in before a firm submits an application meant that according to the idea, there really weren't that many um, reject rejected applications enough to create a comparison group. Um, we are also limited in what we know about cities that are uh, firms that are unassisted in the city otherwise. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about at the end, and George have talked about it earlier, about some data that might be helpful for us in the future to maybe create a comparison group. But that being said, I think a, you know, a look at what's happening in the employment outcomes for at least the assisted firms is helpful in evaluating the program. Um, we also looked at this idea of the preservation of industrial space and how much are firms investing in the city and where, and of course, at what cost to the city. And for that, we received data from the Department of Finance on the payment in lieu of property taxes, the payment, the property taxes they're paying that are, that are discounted. So first, I want to talk about program participation. Um, this graph here shows you the number of new projects entering the program since it began. Um, and I've Put some black lines on here that represent mayoral administrations so you can sort of orient yourself. Um, but what's sort of easy to see here is that you know the, the most projects were entering the program during the early years um, during the Giuliani administration. So from uh, 1994 to 2001 we have an average of 21 projects entering the program a year. Um, that number falls during the de Blasio administration to around 14 projects a year and then continues to fall during the um, I'm sorry, the Bloomberg administration continues to fall during the de Blasio administration to eight projects a year. Um, and there can be a number of reasons of why our program participation has fallen. Um, I talked to you know, some of the IDA consultants, those that help publicize the program and, and, and help firms apply. Um, and you know, there was some discussion that maybe the Giuliani administration was most aggressive in marketing the program. Um, but what I heard most from the IDA, from the consultants I spoke to, beneficiaries, et cetera, was that you know, the, the real maybe underlying cause is the increasing unaffordability of industrial space in the city. Um, and again, there could be, there's a few reasons for that. Um, we know during the Bloomberg administration, there was you know, significant rezoning in the city and the areas of the city are zoned for manufacturing, um, which is basically you know, really constraints where these types of products can be located was you know, impacted but depending on how you measure it. The city lost between seven to nine percent of its acreage zone for manufacturing during the Bloomberg administration. More recently, with the increasing popularity of e-commerce, um, industrial sites are facing increased competition from for last mile distribution and other uses um, that can drive up the cost of the industrial sites. And so, while, whereas earlier in our study period, or earlier in the program's history, the incentive provided by the IDA may have been able to make the difference between a parcel being affordable or not, that increasingly may, may less likely be so. Um, I will say no matter what the reason, the fact that fewer projects are participating in the program in any given year or entering the program in any given year does impact the program's ability to meet its goals. 
So despite the fact that we have you know, fewer projects entering the program each year, because of the 25 year length of the tax benefit, we actually still have a fair number of projects receiving benefits. So you can hear, um, see in 2019, we had around 200 projects were still receiving benefits, even though if only a, a handful entered that year, projects that received benefits earlier are still receiving benefits. Um, on the flip side, on the other side of entrance to the program, um, in terms of participation, we also looked at terminations. So I just mentioned there's a 25 year um, length of benefit for these uh, projects, mostly some of them are a little bit shorter. Um, and we found a, a fair number of firms actually terminate or, or their assistance is terminated or they terminate assistance before the 25 year mark, before they reach maturity. Um, and I grouped those, those projects in two categories, those where resistance was recaptured and those where it was not. And I talked about recapture a little bit earlier. We found around 19% of projects, um, of all projects that were in the program had, had their assistance recaptured. And again, what that means is they had a sort of what they call a recapture event within the first 10 years of benefit. So you can see here the average years of termination for a project where assistance was recaptured was around seven, was an average of seven years. Um, another 23% of projects terminated their assistance before 25 years, but this, the assistance was not recaptured. And that's because um, you know, this, this, this termination was outside of the 10 year um, sort of recapture period. And you can see the average years of termination was 13 years. Um, and the reasons for termination could be similar for both these groups. It's just, you know, one might happen in the, the recapture period and another might not. And the IDA was able to provide us um, for reasons for termination when the assistance was recaptured for those that subset of projects. And you can see I've listed some of the reasons here. Um, selling the location was the most common reason. So again, if you sell the location within the first 10 years, you do have to repay the assistance with interest. Um, for the projects where we knew the total cost of the, um, the total cost of the project to the city and we knew the recapture amount on average, it was about a 70% um, that you'd have to pay back of what you received. That's not exactly a, an apples to apples comparison because as I mentioned, the recapture amount include, can include interest and some penalties, which might be, might be a significant amount. Okay, I'm gonna talk a little bit and move on to our um, employment and outcomes findings. So the first thing we found um, were most of the firms that are participating in this program are already doing business in New York City when they receive assistance. So this is more of a retainment program than necessarily attracting new firms to New York City. Um, according to our analysis, around 94% of firms already had employment in New York City in the year they received assistance. And about 6% would have been new to the city or just new firms. Um, and of those firms that received, assist that received assistance that already had employment, most of them were small. Um, you can see here the average number of employees was 154. Um, the median was 34. There were some fairly lar larger employees that sort of uh, made the average a little bit higher. But if you look at the distribution in the chart below that, um, the first two rows are the number of uh, firms with employment under 100 employees, and that's around 78, 79%. So we know at the beginning, um, I talked about how the, when the program was created, it was targeting small, mid-sized businesses, and that does seem to be sort of borne out and who is, who is taking part in the program. So I mentioned we, we used this database we created of employment for firms that are benefiting to look at what was happening to the firms before they received the benefit. And we saw that the majority of firms um, were actually expanding before they received the benefit from the IDA. The way we defined that is we looked at the average annual growth in the three years before benefit. And if it was greater than 3%, we said they were expanding. If it stayed somewhere between 3% growth and 3% loss, um, we said they were stable and greater than 3% loss contracting. So we found that 61.4% of firms were expanding, another 17% around were staying around the same size and 22% were contracting. And this finding isn't particularly surprising given the way you know, the program works. Um, a firm is are, are entering the program because they're renovating or buying a new space and that might be because they're expanding their business, which could mean expanding their number of employees. So what happens after the benefit? Um, so here uh, we compared the employment of firms in the year they entered the program to three years after their capital project was to be completed. Um, and the reason we use that time frame is because this is the time frame the IDA sets in its application for the firms to, to make their, their job creation goals. And this way we compare how they were doing to their goals. 
And again, we use the same standard. If you grew by more than 3%, we said you're expanding, et cetera. And so we found um, just over half of projects, around 54% expanded post-assistance. They added jobs. The average number of jobs they added was 32, the median nine. Another 9% stayed around the same size um, and around 37% um, contracted, got smaller. The average job was lost for those firms was 34, the median 11. So I mentioned we use this metric so we could compare um, the firms to the goal they set at application. And we found about a third, just under a third met the goal, their goal they set at application after three years of completion. The average um, creation job creation goal was 22 jobs. Um, so about 32% met, met or exceeded that goal, um, but we did see in the previous slide that there were, you know, a fair number of firms that stayed around the same size or actually contracted. If we limit this to um, the number of firms that expand, the firms that expanded, we find around 59%, 59.4% um, met or exceeded their goal. And for those that didn't, the average miss, you know, how many jobs didn't they meet it by was 11 jobs. Um, so when in, we broke out, you know, how we looked at these projects and firms in a few ways, and I'm going to talk today about sector. We wanted to see if there was sort of a pattern to the sectors and who was expanding and who was not, what firms were expanding or not. And there are a few sectors that make up the industrial sector in New York City, um, and I have them here on um, the manufacturing sector, wholesale trade, construction, transportation, warehousing, and retail trade. I'm going to concentrate on manufacturing and wholesale trade because these are the two sectors that um, most of the, the projects that receive assistance through this program are part of. Um, around 60% of the firms are in our manufacturing firms and around 20% wholesale trade. And you can see here um, for manufacturing, around 45% of the manu projects of manufacturing firms expanded during um, that in post assistance at three years after completion. Another 15% were stable and 40% contracted. For wholesale trade, we see somewhat better outcomes. 74% um, expanded post assistance, whereas none were in that stable group and 26% contracted. And one of the reasons we looked at it this way is because we don't have a comparison group. We did want to provide perspective, though, on what was happening in the city. Um, and so we looked at employment in the sectors impacted by the industrial program. And here, this chart here shows you manufacturing and wholesale trade employment writ large for the city over our study period. I'm going to take manufacturing first, which is the orange solid line. Um, and you can see a fairly precipitous decline in manufacturing jobs during the earlier part of our study period from 2000 to 2009. Um, it stabilizes a little bit more towards the end of our study period. Um, and the average annual loss over the whole thing was about 5% of manufacturing jobs. For wholesale trade, um, it is relatively more stable compared to manufacturing, although there are still, a, still an average annual decline of about 1% a year over the study period. And so what this shows us, um, if you think back to the, 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 the graph I showed you previously, where we saw around 45% of manufacturing firms were expanding, another 15% were stable. Um, so 60% either expanding or stable, where in 74% of wholesale trades firms expanding is that it, it appears that the firms that are taking part in the industrial program are doing better um, than the, the, you know, sort of the industry, industry wide in the city. We can't say because we don't have a comparison group that this is because of the industrial program. Um, and we also know that uh, many of these firms were expanding before they entered the program. So what it might show us is that the IDA is selecting firms that are expanding and you know, in hopes to keep those firms in the city and keep those jobs in the city. We also looked at the wages paid by firms participating in the industrial program. And um, this is the average wage paid by firms after assistance um, in constant 2018 inflation adjusted dollars. And you can see it's pretty stable around $61,000 a year. It does go up a little bit at the end. Um, and we saw the, you know, the policy objective of the program talks about creating living wage jobs in the city. And this is um, a living wage. I think a living wage annualizes around $21,000 a year. Um, it also meets a standard that the de Blasio administration set in a, a plan it put out in 2017, which is called a good paying. Um, in, in New, it's a New York work plan. And they created this standard called a good paying job, which is around, pays around $50,000 a year. So um, this wage does meet the living wage job uh, standard and also this sort of higher standard of a good paying job. Um, similar to what we did looked at employment, we wanted to compare the wages paid by firms in this program to sort of sector wide what was going on in the sector. 
Um, and I've done that for manufacturing and wholesale trade here because they are the two sectors most impacted. Um, and you can see the dotted blue line is the, sec the wage paid by firms within the industrial program and the orange solid line is the sector average during our study period. And for manufacturing, which is on the left, you can see that early in the study period, um, the firms participating in the program were paying on average a little bit less than the sector average. In 2012, it sort of switches and the, the firms in the program are paying a little bit more and now sort of on, on par um, with the sector average. For the wholesale trade sector, um, you see fairly consistently over the study period that the firms that are participating in the program do pay on average less than the sector average. So while we found that these firms are paying a living wage, um, even a good paying wage at times and in some years for some sectors, it is less than the average, the sector average as a whole. So I'm gonna switch gears a little bit from now and moving from employment outcomes to um, looking at where these firms are investing in the city and for how much. So this is a map of where the industrial program projects are in New York City. Um, the blue dots represent the projects and I've tried to color in this sort of lime green, the, manu the, the parcel zone for manufacturing the city because most of these, um, these products are sort of constrained by zoning and have to be in, in those sorts of areas. So, you know, it's not a particularly surprising um, look at where these projects are. They're mostly in these um, manufacturing zoned areas in the city. Um, the top neighborhoods with the most projects include Hunter's Point in, in Sunnyside in Queens, Hunts Point in the Bronx, Sunset Park West in Brooklyn, Mott Haven in Port Morris in the Bronx, and East New York in Brooklyn. Um, we also looked at the, the types of the building class, the sites, um, to get a little more of a sense of you know, where this investment was happening. And so we looked at the, the building class or building use um, of uh, the sites when the assistance was granted and then five years after to see if um, there had been a change. And so the building use at STAR generally um, it was you know, not surprising, was more majority factory in warehouses. <clears throat> Around 8% were vacant at the time of assistance. Um, and then five years later, not, not that many changed uses, about 19% changed uses. And it was mostly among these sort of most common uses. So a factory became a warehouse, vacant, the vacant parcel became a factory, et cetera. Uh, and so we also looked at the amount of investment and we found that the program resulted in more than $3.1 billion of investment. This is exclusive of acquisition costs. I might say more than 3.1 billion because we were missing um, from projects early in our study period their investment amount. Um, so if you, you're going to go back to all the 1995, it'll be higher than that. Um, the average investment amount was around 9.5 million, the median 1.1 million, which is around um, what's required to, to enter the program right now. Um, I want to say these are all based on final cost budgets. We didn't have um, data on the actual costs. Um, so take that with a grain of salt. Um, and the reason the difference between the average and the median, there's pretty a big difference there. And that's because there were a handful of projects that had much higher cost budgets um, that sort of drew up the average about, there were about eight or 10 of those. So let's talk about the cost to the city. So I mentioned earlier that there are several tax benefits that are available to um, projects that are taking part in this program. And so I've outlined them here um, the property tax benefit, the discounted property tax is the blue diagonal portion, the mortgage retorting tax benefit um, is the horizontal orange stripe, and there's, it's harder to see because it's smaller relative to those two, but a green polka dot for sales tax and then blue for energy taxes. And energy taxes are benefits that were available to some of the um, projects in the program sort of in earlier years. But this, what I want you to take away here, um, first of all, is how the, you know, the property tax is the greatest share of the tax expenditure in any given year and for most projects. Um, for example, in 29, fiscal year 2019, we found that the cost of the program was around $31.5 million and um, there were about almost all 31 million of that was property tax expenditure. The mortgage recording tax expenditure is the second greatest um, and that really is dependent on the number of projects that close, what their mortgages are, um, and when, you know, when they receive the mortgage. Um, for the property tax benefit though, I want you to also to notice that it's growing over time. Um, some of that is artificial from 2000 to 2005, we were missing pilot data on about 20% of projects. So this, this is actually um, a low estimate. Um, the, the Department of Finance didn't have data for those older projects, but from 2006 through 2019, um, when we had much more complete data, you can still see that the property tax expenditure is growing in each year. And there's 
two reasons for that. One, we are adding new projects. So, you know, projects stay in for 25 years. Some leave early, as we talked about, um, but, you know, we are adding new projects each year. But we also found that the amount per, for each project, the amount of the property tax expenditure um, actually grows over the life of the benefit until it starts to decline during a phase out. And that's because the, the way the pilot structured, the pilot, which is what the property, which the firms actually pay, um, grows at a slower rate than what they would have paid um, without the benefit, which makes the, the, the tax expenditure increase for each project over time. And so I wanna talk a little bit about how the pilot is calculated. Um, so there are, as you probably know, two parts of your property tax, the tax on land and the tax on building and improvements on the land or um, the building. And so this program provides a discount on both of those. Um, for many years, the way that the, the discount on land was calculated was based on your number of employees. So it was $500 um, times the number of employees that you had when you entered the program. During the life of the, the program, they changed it. Um, and you would, you know, every five years, they would check on your number of employees. And if you grew, then your land abatement would become bigger and you'd pay less um, tax on your land. If you lost employees, you'd end up paying more property tax on your land. Um, in 2017, they changed it completely. And now the land pilot is based on your investment amount. So, um, you know, the more that you invest, put into your capital investment, the, the less that you have to pay in land taxes. And this is sort of more similar to some of the ways other city tax incentives are structured. The tax on the, the discount you get on the building has been fairly consistent over the life of the program. And um, building taxes are stabilized at the amount um, when you enter the program. So you're not paying additional taxes on the improvements you make because of the, the, pro the project you're doing under the program. Um, if you make improvements later on outside of what you, you know, what got you into this program, you do have to pay full taxes on that portion and that's called the additional improvements pilot. And also if you are renting out a large portion of your space, you um, may have to pay what they call a subtenant pilot. So full taxes on the square footage um, that you're renting out. So conclusions, final re future research, um, a summary of, Asian, summary of our findings. So is the program meeting its goal to create living wage jobs in New York City? Uh, we found you know, over half, 54% of firms did expand three years after completion compared to start. So they were creating some jobs. Another 9% stayed around the same size. Um, of those creating jobs though, we did find that 41% you know, didn't meet their goal. However, we saw that the sectors served by the program were generally contracting during the study period. So these firms did seem to be doing better than the industry overall, even if not all of them were creating jobs. Um, however, we found that most participants were expanding before assistance. So we cannot say, as I mentioned earlier, that this program caused these firms to, to create jobs. Um, and it might be that the IDA is selecting firms that are expanding um, to participate in the program. Um, we found that the average wage of party firms can be lower than the sector average, but is still a good slash um, living wage. Is the program helping to diversify the city economy and preserve industrial space? I think here is where the fact that fewer firms are participating is really you know, in having an impact because you're obviously preserving less industrial space if fewer firms, um, if, you're, if you're assisting fewer firms to actually make investments in those spaces. And that's similar with diversifying the city economy. There's, you know, that'll be fewer industrial jobs in the city. Um, the legislation that requires our evaluation also asks us to look at whether the goals of the program are still relevant and do they align with current policy goals. I do think the goals of the program are still relevant. Um, the industrial sector is more stable than it was when this program was created back in 1995, but they're at a few, you know, a lower level. There are still fewer industrial jobs in the city. Um, we do see increasing competition for industrial space. So there is perhaps still a need to provide assistance to these industrial firms. And then, you know, you know, this is sort of a pre-COVID finding, but you know, industrial jobs um, are still paying a higher wage on average than jobs that than the portions of the economy that were expanding pre-COVID. Um, retail, leisure, and hospitality, education, health sectors, for example. And I do think at least the de Blasio administration and the city council are interested in preserving um, the industrial sector in early, early in the de Blasio administration, the, the, the administration worked with the city council to release the 10 point industrial action plan, which talked about modernizing the industrial sector and preserving, preserving space for the industrial sector. And also, as I mentioned, um, the New York Works Plan, which had a specific shout out to programs of the IDA, um, talking about because they are discretionary, the city can target companies 
through these programs that will use their benefits to further city policy goals like good paying creation of good paying jobs. Um, the legislation that requires our analysis also asks us to talk about recommend recommendations for data collection that for future evaluations of this program that might allow for um, um, a better evaluation. And so the first, um, first recommendation I talked about a little bit, but it would be really helpful to have a comparison group um, of firms. So collecting data on firms that are eligible that don't apply. So you know, I talked about the application process. And so even if firms aren't submitting an application, if we could, you know, when the IDA is meeting with the firms, um, you know, collecting some data there, and then maybe we could have a comparison group. Um, it would be helpful if the IDA could provide data on actual project costs. We use final cost budgets for this uh, report. And that's especially true now that the pilot, the land, the land pilot is based on investment amount. I didn't talk about this much during the presentation, um, but it'd be helpful if the uh, Department of Finance could report pilots billed and paid through its data systems. IBO has access to the Department of Finance's property tax data systems, which is very useful for us. We don't have to request data. We're used to using that data. It's all sort of um, set for us, but for some reason, pilots are not included in that data. So we had to make a request for the Department of Finance for that data. It came in spreadsheets that were a little cumbersome um, and a little more time consuming to match with our property tax data. And so it would just be, you know, easier to do the analysis and also just much more transparent if pilots were included in those data systems. And lastly, um, access to business tax records. And this is something the city council has been um, advocating on IBO's behalf, um, which we appreciate. So IBO does not have access to business tax records. And this is due to, we need state legislation to allow us to. And so just a few weeks ago, um, some legislation was introduced in, in the state to give IBO access to these records. Um, and what that would allow us to do is just have a much fuller picture of the, both the firms that are receiving benefits through this program, as well as many other tax expenditure programs in the city. Um, so we can know more about their profitability and just more about those firms, but would also give us a lot more information about unassisted firms. So that in the future, we could maybe create a comparison group that would help us create a comparison group. And that's it for me. Um, happy to take questions on this analysis. I think we're going to move right into EDC. Good. Council, did you swear them in or? Yes, they've been sworn in. So EDC is okay, so, ready. Yep. EDC is there? Right, yes, um, yes, I wasn't, wasn't able to unmute myself, but I was uh, oh, just okay. allowed to do so. Okay. Hi. Um, so, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, good morning, Chairman Drum and members of the Committee on Finance. Uh, my name is Krishna Maladi, and I am a Vice President in the Strategic Investments Group at the New York City Economic Development Corporation, or EDC. I am also the Executive Director of the New York City Industrial Development Agency, or IDA. And on behalf of the IDA, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to offer our perspective on the industrial program. And after my remarks, my colleague, Javon Singletary, and I will be happy to answer any questions that you may have. So the IDA is a public benefit corporation formed under state law in 1974 to prevent unemployment by promoting, retaining, attracting, encouraging, and developing a sound economy in New York City. The IDA supports a wide range of companies and projects from a diverse mix of sectors across the five boroughs, from supermarkets and underserved areas across the city to logistics and air freight companies at JFK Airport. The IDA can assist non-industrial companies and projects. However, given today's topic, my discussion will focus on our assistance to industrial and manufacturing companies. The IDA provides assistance to eligible projects in a rigorous process-oriented way is consistent with our role as a steward of public tax dollars, a role we take very seriously as part of the administration of incentive programs. To incentivize companies to make significant capital expend investments in industrial facilities, 
The IDA provides three kinds of tax incentives, uh, which uh, Elizabeth mentioned during her presentation. Property tax abatements, sales and use tax exemptions, and, more, and a mortgage recording tax abatement. These tax benefits were designed to reduce companies' transactional costs and operating expenses, helping them to build new facilities, purchase new equipment, and renovate existing facilities to remain competitive in today's economy. All benefits through the IDA are discretionary. To receive IDA assistance, a company must demonstrate it needs our incentives to expand, and that without these incentives, it would have to either scale back or forego their expansion. Each applicant is assessed based on that need and the economic impact of the proposed project. After the execution of the agreement, our role shifts to compliance and surveillance. Our compliance team monitors the project's compliance with the requirements under the agreement, and when necessary, recaptures benefits. Approximately $2.1 million was recovered in fiscal year 20 from non-compliant projects, and more than $120 million has been recovered since fiscal year 2003. The overwhelming majority of projects are compliant with only 2% of projects currently facing enforcement action. Over the last few years, we have incorporated a series of important changes to both expand opportunity and improve transparency. We've instituted MWDBE goals for IDA projects to encourage benefit recipients to procure services provided by certified contractors. We continue to encourage local hiring by connecting our projects to the Hire NYC program. We provide the City Council with a summary of the project and an explanation of its benefits prior to the project's public hearing. And during the pandemic, we have hosted virtual public hearings and board meetings that are open to the public in order to allow anyone to learn about our projects. We've begun to partner with local nonprofit organizations that serve small industrial and manufacturing businesses, such as the Greenpoint Manufacturing and Design Center, also known as GMDC, and Evergreen in North Brooklyn, to meet the growing needs of small industrial businesses and entrepreneurs that are looking for affordable and flexible space. In 2019, we relaunched the Accelerated Sales Tax Exemption Program, or ASTEP, in order to provide sales and use tax exemptions to industrial manufacturing commercial and food retail businesses that are looking to construct or renovate space in underserved communities in New York City. The IDA recognizes the critical role the industrial sector plays in, in New York City's economy by creating good job opportunities for New Yorkers. Today, the industrial ecosystem, which spans manufacturing and goods distribution, employs thousands of New Yorkers and provides many access points to good paying jobs. Median wages are over $50,000 a year, and over 60% of jobs within the sector do not require a college degree. Many offer a component of on-the-job training. Further, nearly half of all New Yorkers working in industrial and manufacturing jobs were born outside the United States, making it an important pathway for helping immigrants become part of the New York City economy. The IDA is an integral part of the city's strategy to increase the quality, to increase quality accessible job opportunities. By preserving, enhancing, and building industrial space throughout the five boroughs, we believe the IDA helps diversify the city's economy, helps support advanced manufacturers, incentivize and spark innovation, and creates pathways for many workers. To give you a feel for the impact of our work, I wanna share a few examples of the industrial program projects that the IDA has supported throughout the years. So uh, one example is Steinway & Sons, uh, which started in New York City about 160 years ago and has grown to represent the finest in piano craftsmanship throughout the world. Since 1999, the IDA has been assisting the piano manufacturer to maintain its storied piano manufacturing site in Astoria, Queens. Acme Smokefish Corporation is a producer of the highest quality smoked seafood items and its history dates back to the early 1900s. Since 2003, the IDA has been assisting this fourth generation family owned and operated business to operate out of its Greenpoint, Brooklyn facility. And Crystal Window and Door Systems embodies a quintessential immigrant success story. Thomas Chen, the founder of the company, made it here in New York City as the company became one of North America's preeminent window and door manufacturers. Since 1999, the IDA has been assisting the company to continue to operate out of its headquarters in College Point, Queens. These are just three of the close to 200 companies that we support through the industrial program. These companies currently have close to 23,000 jobs, up from about 7,000 jobs when these projects first applied for financial assistance through the IDA. 
And COVID-19 has impacted manufacturing and industrial businesses profoundly, as we all know, especially those that depend on workers whose jobs cannot be carried out remotely. Companies have been forced to nimbly adopt new safety measures, implement emergency operations plans, reevaluate their product ranges, and assess their supply chain agility and resiliency. While continuing to struggle to overcome these challenges, New York City's industrial businesses showed the way forward in responding to this health, economic, and humanitarian crisis. They joined the city's unprecedented response by rapidly mobilizing to produce and distribute over 100 million pieces of personal protective equipment, or PPE, to protect New Yorkers, including frontline workers at private and public healthcare facilities from the spread of COVID-19. The city through EDC coordinated and partnered with approximately 70 local manufacturers. Together, we set up local supply chains from scratch and produced and distributed critical medical supplies. Through October, 30, October 31, 2020, these partnerships resulted in the local production of over 4.2 million medical gowns, 8.4 million face shields, 1.1 million test kits, bridge ventilators. Beyond providing much needed medical equipment, local production of this equipment supported nearly three jobs in the city while strengthening our emergency preparedness. During its time of need, the city was able to rely on our industrial sector, including companies that received benefits from the IDA industrial program to provide life-saving life equipment. And I will give two examples. So one is Boyce Technologies, which designs and manufactures mass transit communication systems. In April of 2016, the company entered into an agreement with the IDA to create a 58,000 square foot facility in Long Island City, Queens, to expand its operations. Once of the pandemic, the company designed and produced FDA approved ventilators in record time to assist in the city's COVID-19 response. And Gary Plastic Packaging Corporation, established in 1963, manufactures rigid plastic packaging such as boxes and containers. In October, October 1990, we entered into an agreement with the IDA to acquire and improve a 294,000 square foot facility in Hunts Point in the Bronx. During the pandemic, Gary Plastic quickly pivoted its Hunts Point facility to serve as a major local producer of protective face shields and counter shields, as well as sneeze guards to prevent the spread of the coronavirus. To date, they have produced about 1.5 million face shields for our PPE initiative. This past year clearly demonstrated why the industrial sector is so important to New York City. At the peak of the pandemic, when the city was facing critical supply shortages, our local manufacturing businesses and their employees stepped up to help keep New, York's, to help keep New Yorkers safe. We know that the IDA cannot solve every challenge our industrial companies face, particularly in light of the intense global and regional competitive pressures, but we are confident that the industrial program is an effective tool for attaining this important sector in New York City. We look forward to the impending release of the IBO report. We also look forward to evaluating the recommendations outlined in Ms. Brown's presentation. We agree that in this time of fiscal emergency precipitated by COVID-19, it is prudent to evaluate the program to identify ways to optimize precious public resources as we continue to assist industrial companies that are committed to investing in New York City. Thank you again for giving us the opportunity to testify and we are happy to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, just before I go on to questions, I'd like to say that we have been joined by several additional council members. I just wanna pull up their names. Uh, Council members Dharma Diaz, Moya, Powers, uh, Cumbo, Van Bremer, and Gibson are here with us. And um, I think this is actually our first hearing hearing uh, with our new subcommittee chairperson, uh, Council member Helen Rosenthal. So thank you and welcome Helen also in that capacity. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, now, let me just go to questions. I'm gonna start with questions to IBO. And then I do have a couple of questions for uh, EDC as well. And I wanna thank Ms. Brown for the tremendous work that you did on this report. And uh, it's so detailed and very interesting. And um, you, know, you really did a great job on it. And uh, I just wanna congratulate you and thank you for that. Uh, of course, we wanna thank and also uh, welcome our friends from um, EDC, Mr. Uh, Omolade, I hope I said that correctly. 
and of course, Miss Singletary as well. Uh, for this evaluation uh, of IDC's industrial program, when do you expect the final report to be released and what remains uh, outstanding on the report? Um, I can talk about what sort of is within the report, George, you can talk about. <laughs> um, the, there are a few things that, you know, this was an overview. Our report has a lot more details on our methodology, um, more details on the program. You know, we looked at changes in, you know, some changes in what the firm's benefiting over time. It's, it's, a, it's a long program have been. Um, and we, we also looked at, you know, inter, intersections with other city tax incentives. Um, we hope it will be, really, George, when talk about release time, maybe? Um, I would expect it to be out in, you know, a month or so. Uh, there's a, you know, a first draft that's uh, under review. Um, so it will be moving along, uh, you know, as, along with all of our work on, on the preliminary and the executive budget. But uh, we're, we're working on it and I expect it will be out shortly. Okay, thank you. And um, in conducting this evaluation, um, which agencies did you work with in obtaining the necessary data and uh, how was the working relationship with these agencies and they re were they responsive to uh, IBO's um, request for information? So we requested data from the IDA and Department of Finance um, and yeah, they were responsive, um, provided us with almost all the data we requested and where they weren't able to provide data, they did provide explanations and you know, we came up with other, you know, maybe other data points that they might be able to provide. So I, I heard in your testimony also the recommendation of working with, um, um, with the finance um, department to uh, give you access to some of their records as well. And I hope to follow up with you on that uh, later on also. Um, now that IBO has almost completed evaluating a second tax expenditure program, are there any best practices or lessons learned that you can recommend for the next evaluation? Um, for, for this, this is a, one of the things that I you know, learned a lot about doing with this evaluation is this is the first time we've used the QCW, which is the employment data that we get from the Department of Labor um, in this sort of analysis where we're matching it with firms. And so that was really a great exercise for me and one I assume we'll be using going forward in so much that economic development programs often involve looking at em employment. Um, so that was a big takeaway for me. Um, and I hope to use that in future evaluations as well. So did the IBO encounter any data challenges uh, during the evaluation process outside of the spreadsheets? <laughs> <laughs> outside of the spreadsheets? Um, you know, not, not, none that are any different than really the sort of the data challenges you fi face when looking at, you know, large data sets um, and matching firms over time. But, you know, uh, no, not, so nothing, nothing terrible. I mean, the access to data for business tax records is something that we would, you know, I talked about at the end and something that hopefully we're moving towards. Um, there's, there's state legislation that's been introduced. I think the council had a lot to do with that. Um, so we can, we can get more data on these firm, on, you know, firms all over the city that would help for this evaluation, but also a lot of other evaluations, especially those that are, you know, actually a tax expenditure of business taxes where we, we you know, we really need this sort of data. If I, if I could just jump in. Chair, sure. Chair Drum, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the issue with the um, spreadsheets, you know, obviously, you know, they, they made it a little bit more difficult to sort the data out. But there's also just a, a broader question outside of the evaluations, uh, which Elizabeth mentioned, you know, by not putting the pilot amount through the, the city's uh, property tax charge system, uh, you, you lose a lot of transparency about exactly how much is there. Um, you know, and when there, there is some reporting that the council receives from OMB and I think from, from EDC IDA, uh, but you, know, you're, you, you, don't have the, you don't have access to the, the data that you could to answer almost any other question about an exemption or an abatement in the property tax system. When there's a pilot, it kind of drifts off into this black hole a little bit. And uh, aside from making our work easier to do, uh, it also would, would have a real benefit, I think, uh, in terms of transparency. Yeah, I mean, I think it's an interesting discussion, um, Mr. Sweeting, as well, because um, if I'm recalling correctly, the uh, mayor um, has said that the biggest loss in revenue this year in the budget 
was due to commercial property tax uh, drops uh, in, in collection and drops of that. And I think really why we're trying to look at this overall is, 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 is you know, related to that, um, you know, not maybe directly because these are all long-term um, uh, programs that you have, but um, what might be the effect if we, you know, were to not have this program in terms of the collection of uh, property taxes, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that, that is an interesting um, piece that we need in terms of um, transparency. Um, based on IBO's preliminary findings, there have been fewer firms entering the industrial program in recent years. And I know you suggested there could be various reasons for that, uh, but were there any uh, trends in the data that explained the decline in the program enrollment? Well, that's hard to say because, again, we don't have access to, you know, one of the things we don't know is if there is, you know, if, for example, if the IDA is becoming more discriminating and that's why fewer firms are entering the program. So we don't know how many firms are applying, you know, reaching the level. We only know the firms they get in. Um, so if we had data on the firms that were interested and were ineligible or, you know, ended up not being approved before sort of the approval process, we would know a little bit more. That would help us know a little bit more about why fewer firms are, firms are participating. Without that, I was sort of left, you know, talking with, um, you know, the IDA um, and the beneficiaries of the program and then these consultants, which led, you know, and just looking at what's happening with the industrial sector in New York City um, at large. What factors, if any, might dissuade um, applicants from seeking benefits under the program? Compliance and recapture. Um, so, you know, uh, there are recapture, for example, like ICAP or other sort of um, as a right tax expenditure programs in the city aren't necessarily they're not subject to recapture like the, pro the, um, the programs of the IDA. That may dissuade um, firms from applying. Um, there is also some compliance, um, you know, this reporting, annual reporting that is also not found for other programs. I will say though, in talking to, uh, this, was a, this was definitely a quantitative analysis. Um, I didn't do surveys or anything like that, but I did speak to, um, you know, a handful of beneficiaries and for the ones that enter the program. So again, they've decided it's okay. They didn't find the compliance particularly burdensome um, nor the sort of the fear of recapture in that you know, they said the benefit was worth it. Um, but that could, you know, there are tax, there are different programs available to other, you know, maybe available to firms that would not have the recapture or the compliance and reporting of this program that might, if they qualify for those, might may have them take those, those programs instead. Are there any programmatic changes that, um, you know, might increase participation in the program? Again, it's sort of hard to tell without knowing who's not applying or who's not making it into the program. Um, I, it's so obviously a policy decision. You might not want to trade recapture and compliance for more participants. The more participants, the more costly it is. And so it is a balance of choosing the participants that are going to actually allow the program to meet its goals. Um, but I think there are, you know, there are some ways to think about the program if you wanted to, you know, maybe increase the marketing of it, um, or just look at the, you know, what are the benefits that you're offering and are they meeting the needs of the firms that are, that are, you know, looking to expand. IBO's preliminary findings indicated that over half of the firms participating in the industrial program experienced uh, employment growth before the end of um, the uh, benefit term. I think you said 53%, if I'm not mistaken. Um, can you describe the types of industries that experienced this employment growth and were there any noticeable trends or factors that might have, have attributed to uh, that growth, growth as well? Sure. So our measure for post assistance, our measure was look, we looked at employment three years after their project, their capital project was completed. Um, and that's what I presented today. We also looked when we were doing the analysis at four years, five years, and the, the difference in you know, the number of the share of firms expanding doesn't change very much. I mean, um, and so, you know, we did see, as I showed earlier, that, you know, wholesale trade firms um, sort of had the, the best outcomes, the majority of those ex expanded. Um, but again, because we don't, we don't know so much about the individual working of the firm. Again, if we had access to business tax records, we would know a little bit more about the profitability, and that might allow us to draw some more conclusions about um, what types of firms are, you know, are, are doing sort of the best under the program. Um, we looked at the size of the firm, you know, do smaller firms expand more than, than mid-sized firms. It is, it is easier for a smaller firm to increase by 3%, I will say that, but because most of the firms are small, 
um, we didn't we didn't really see a pattern there. Um, so, so yeah, I would say we know we we know wholesale trade did the best manufacturing, um, which is the great their, their greatest number of firms were sort of mid range um, relative to the other sectors, but the other sectors are relatively small. And, and just for my own information, so I, I, I'm thinking that you're saying that um, uh, expansion is measured by uh, employment growth, or, yeah. Uh, or uh, yeah, just by employment growth. Yes, yeah, okay. that's how we defined it here. We do, we don't know about their you know their income or. Um, that right. this, you know, again, if we add a little more data, we could perhaps look at, you know, the bottom line of the company, the profitability, et cetera. Good. So, how do firms participating in the program compare to these firms within their sector not receiving benefits from the city? So we were on, we didn't have a comparison group, so we couldn't say, okay, uh, you know, this firm grew more than an unassisted firm. But what we could do is just look at the employment in these sectors overall for the city. Was this a sector that was growing during the study period? Was this a, a sector that was contracting during the study period? And for manufacturing and wholesale trade, which were the two sectors that were sort of most impacted in terms of number of projects, the manufacturing sector was, you know, contracting. Uh, both were contracting, and the manufacturing sector was contracting. Um, by a greater amount during the study period. Your dog okay. is and <laughs> ID, I'm sorry. I heard your dog interested in that question. So. <laughs> <laughs> Very interested, exactly. Yeah. I just love these Zooms, you know. Uh, anyway, <laughs> if IDA uh, were to discontinue the industrial program, what impact, if any, would, have, uh, would it have in the city's economy and its residents? Well, the, if it were to stop taking new projects, there would not be an immediate fiscal impact because the benefit for the pro the projects that are in the program lasts for 25 years. Um, you know, we did find our, our finding was that the majority of, of firms that enter the program do create new jobs. Would they create new jobs without the program? Um, that's a great question, and we can't say definitively. Um, would they leave the city and create those jobs elsewhere? Or would they stay? You know, again, I talked to some firms and obviously the firms that are participating in the program say this tax benefit makes a big difference to me. Um, and that's obvious because, you know, I think they, that's why they're participating in the program. Um, it is hard to say for sure if none of, you know, if none of those jobs would, would, would still be here today. Um, but just to, you know, reiterate, the tax expenditure would continue for, you know, a while because of the, the number of firms that are they're already have a lease with the IDA. Um, I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Okay, <laughs> unmute yourself. That's the other Zoom thing today. You know, um, I think that's the big question of the day um, as to whether or not you know um, the benefit of it. Obviously, uh, and uh, I know that Mr. Uh, um, Omolade mentioned you know some of the success programs, successful programs, uh, which is good. I, and I think that you know it, it is helpful to know that. But the question is, is the one we just began, just were addressing. I will say one thing. Um, one of the findings that we had is that, you know, a fair share of firms don't actually make it to the termination date. So they have a 25 year benefit, but, you know, there are firms where assistance is recaptured. And there were another, I think, around 23% of firms that terminated before 25 years. Um, and so, and the other finding we found is that the, the cost of the tax expenditure actually increases sort of over the life of the, the benefit. And so there is a body of research um, that says, you know, when firms are looking to locate or make a, you know, a purchase decision, they're not necessarily thinking 25, 30 years out, they might be thinking 10, 12 years out. And so there's the possibility that you could reduce the, the term of the benefit and it wouldn't necessarily, um, you know, make it less it was attractive to firms. Um, and, you know, for the firms that do stay in the program, you would perhaps be saving some money towards, towards the end of the program. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's that's interesting. Uh, and what about any recommendations um, on which tax expenditures, uh, you know, should be evaluated next? So obviously, this is a discussion we need to have with city council. I think one of the ones that you know, it's a very large, it's a it's a larger tax expenditure than this program, um, and one that has not been evaluated by us or much that I know of is the you know the reprogram, the relocation and assistance program. Um, we would need for this particular this, because this impacts business taxes. We would need data on business taxes that you know we're trying to get through this legislation with the state, um, and you know the Department of Finance. If we were unable to get that data, could hopefully provide us some summary data. But I think that one is um, particularly ripe 
um, for an analysis. Okay, great. Thank you. I, and I know my co-chair has um, some questions for IBO, and then I also have some questions for EDC, and then we'll go to council member questions. So I know uh, co-chair Rosenthal, do you want to um, ask your question now? Yes, thank you so much. And thank you for the kind introduction, Chair Drum. I really, such a pleasure working with you. I can't tell you how much, um, it's a lot. So uh, just a couple of quick questions about how it's going. Um, they're a little bit random, so bear with me. Um, first of all, could worker cooperatives apply for uh, the, the benefits, IDA benefits? That's probably a good question for the IDA. I assume they could if they, as long as they met the other eligibility criteria, um, you know, that they're- Right. I mean, the only thing about them is that their, their ownership is different. They're, right? Hmm. I don't know that there's a, at least from what I've read, that there is a restriction on that, but probably IDA would- would know that better. Omolati, do you want to answer that? Sure, yeah, yeah. The short answer is yes. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, cooperatives are, are definitely free to apply for IDA incentives, assuming that they meet the other eligibility. Sure, sure. You know, I think it would be worth coordinating with SBS on that because they have, um, they have responsibility for helping to nurture worker cooperatives. So they send information to them and, um, I don't know. I, I'm not sure they know this, so it would be worth trying to get the message out to them. Um, next, I'm sort of wondering if there have ever been, um, again, I'm all over the map here, so bear with me. I'm wondering if there have ever been deviations requested um, for an application to the industrial program. So um, you know, according to the uniform tax exemption policy, the agency is permitted to deviate from a program's policy if staff obtains approval from the board of directors. So have they ever applied or requested? And could you describe um, some of the circumstances where they would be given an exemption or a deviation, whatever it's called? Yes, I can. Yes, I can answer that question. So, for industrial projects, um, we have uh, requested deviations from the UTEP um, for projects, especially ones that are uh, developer-led projects, um, such as ones that we've worked on with GMDC and Evergreen, where uh, where we believe that a an uh, alteration to our standard benefit schedule is needed in order to incentivize the project. So, for example. Um, we have a lot of flexibility when it comes to uh, how we uh, structure these incentives. So the deviations that we requested for those projects were to have a full abatement of the property tax for about 15 years with a phase out for the remaining 10 years of the benefit period, essentially front loading the benefits to the period of time where it was most impactful to both the developers as, you know, in terms of GMBC, as well as their tenant companies. Um, so we have requested, you know, deviations um, um, from the UTEP um, for, for those types of projects. Has the board ever denied them? They have not. Um, so what we do, and, and this, I think, sort of goes to a question about sort of our application process. In general, we pre-screen a lot of projects. So that by the time it actually gets to the board of directors, we're very confident that it will be approved. So um the board has not uh, rejected a deviation. Makes sense. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm wondering in the presentation, which was amazing from IBO, so thank you all for that. It's just incredibly informative and helpful. I'm wondering about um, something that I noticed that you toggle between sort of um, talking about good paying jobs being those that are over $50,000 a year and sort of a living wage. Um, and I'm wondering about, you know, sort of if you have definitions for all these different terms or if they're a little bit interchangeable. 
Um, so the living wage is step by step by, I don't know, somebody, <laughs> I forget who says it. Um, and I believe it's around $21,000 if you annualize it. And there's some benefits that go along with that as well. Mm -hmm. um, and the good paying wage came from a, I believe it came from the New York Works Plan, which is a plan that the Blasio administration released in 2017, where it defined it as $50,000 a year. So we'll yeah. And, and the goal of this program talks about a living wage, but I, because the IDA sort of mentioned in that report, I did want to mention the, the good paying job as well. Yeah, it's interesting. Another thing you might want to look at is the sustainable jobs. Um, I think there's actually, I think the mayor's office has a unit that puts out what is a sustainable wage um, for every borough and different you know, um, numbers of people in the family. I think it's worth looking at that as a criteria as well. Um, it's just, you know, more, a more realistic number. Um, and then so sort of along that, um, and given the detail in your analysis, I'm just wondering if you could look at pay parity among the workers across um, gender and race. Our data, unfortunately, doesn't have that. So we, the data we get from the Department of Labor is just sort of, you know, it's an, it's an average wage, or it's a total wage um, for the employees for each quarter. So we don't know anything actually about um, the employees. And, but do you think IDA has that information? Oh, um, good point. Um, I, I don't know they collect it by gender. Again, maybe... I could talk about. It. I don't think by gender, no. Would we have uh, to legislate that, or do you think if we just asked, they would do it and turn it over? Um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we could. You could ask. I always in favor of just asking and seeing what happens in terms of data. <laughs> I mean, I always, um, you know, as we look at issues of pay parity, I always think the lowest hanging fruit is let's just look at our government numbers because we should have easy access to those. And IDA is an extension. Or, or, I mean, or could could Vicky Bean, you know, ask those questions or, you know, get that we information? Have to provide it, but. I don't, I don't believe it's currently asked in their employee benefits report again. Um, do you think it would be valuable? Do you think it could be low enough hanging fruit, easily enough accessible to be able to be a good database? Yeah, I mean, the, the firms would have to provide it themselves, I assume. Um, so we always take you know, that with a sort of grain of salt, but I'm all, IBO is pretty much always in favor of more data as long as it's not incredibly burdensome. Which is why I like IVO, but um, I mean, in, right. So to your point, not incredibly burdensome. So given the abatements and benefits that these firms get, do you think this falls within the realm of reasonableness to ask about um, pay by gender and race? They already, I mean, then, yeah, and I think the, the employee benefit report has been expanded several times in sort of the detail that is asked to report. It was one of the reasons why we didn't, one of the reasons we didn't use it is because the, the, what, the, what, have, what has been asked has changed over time, and it, is, it has been expanded. So there's questions now about living wage. Um, and look, actually, there's questions about where, where people live, I believe, who live in the city or not. So um, it would follow in line with what they, already, they are asking. So mm -hmm. it, it could possibly be something they could add on there, yes. Does CDC want to add in? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, we are uh, you know, open, as, as um, Elizabeth just mentioned, you know, we have adjusted the uh, annual reports that companies have to send to us um, to reflect um, additional types of information. A lot of that is, has been driven by the information which we in turn have to send to the city council and um, and as part of you know overall sort of city um, reporting around the program. So I think that if there was a you know a request um, you know to include this information in our reports, um, that is something that we are open to exploring. Um, you know, not just you know in the uh, situation of um, understanding a gender um, you know. Uh, you know, issues when it comes to um, compensation, but also 
other types of questions, um, we're definitely open to working uh, with you guys to um, to uh, figure out, you know, what is the best way to um, get that information for. Okay, so bear with the cynicism of somebody who's been in the council for seven years. So be patient with me. It strikes me there are three ways for this to move forward. One is consider yourself asked. I, we just raised it at a hearing, at a public hearing. The second is we could put it in writing to you, or the third is we could try to legislate it. W which way do you think, which way do you recommend we go? I think that, um, that the best approach would be to, I think, understand, uh, you know, what is, I guess, maybe the universe of things that, you know, that it would be good for us to explore um, and to sort of think about that and have that, um, you know, I guess, maybe put in writing and sort of set down, I, I guess, a specific date by which we want to have that operate in a, or, you know, become effective. So I think that, um, you know, it's definitely noted. And as I said, you know, something that we're, uh, that we definitely are open to and believe in. Um, so I think as a next step, it would be good to uh, continue the conversation, maybe have uh, work towards something in writing that can um, Wait, play out all of the- all Why don't we have staff the, come- uh, yeah. to do. We'll have staff set up a meeting for us. And why don't you come to the table with the list of uh, questions that you think are askable that we could you know, get information from and, and then we'll take it from there, okay? Yes, that, that sounds good. Okay, I appreciate that. Last question, um, and that is given, uh, and, and Ms. Brown, I think this is for you, sort of, do you have a sense, or, or either of you, sorry, um, during COVID, whether or not you've had to slow down issuing, you know, allowing, or issuing debt or supporting debt um, during during the time when it's been harder for the city to access the markets? So uh, my study period ended <laughs> before COVID, so I will leave IDA to talk about that. You mean this particular program, I said? But... Yeah. I mean, just given that, um, right, so, during the last, I guess, year, full year, pretty much now, has um, given that the board of directors has to authorize the bond transaction, has over the last year, has the board authorized any bonds? Uh, so the um, the IDA board has not authorized any tax exempt bonds for manufacturing companies. Um, we actually have not uh, done any of those transactions in quite a while. Um, there are a lot of reasons for that, mostly because the uh, the legislation or, or really this sort of the regulation, the types of bond transactions has not really been updated in several decades. And for many um, projects, um, essentially, you know, for projects in New York City, they're sort of too large to really, um, for that to be an effective um, financing option. Um, so, yeah, so we haven't, I think most, you know, at this point, most uh, industrial manufacturing companies that are seeking financing are not using tax exempt bonds, but instead are using other forms of financing for their projects. And I think that's also true, not just in New York City, but also across the country, because again, the regulations haven't really been updated. So there's been a sort of a decline in using manufacturing bonds. Is there a different type of bond that IDA issues besides manufacturing? Issue bonds. I'm sorry. I'm just trying to understand your question, your answer. Um, sure. Mr. Sweeting. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, okay. yeah, so um, I guess the, the background is that the IDA historically used to issue tax exempt bonds for a variety of projects. So anything from Manufacturing companies to uh, nonprofit organizations to um, you know airport facilities um, to the city of projects Yankee Stadium and City Field. Um, since then, most of that capacity has shifted to our sister organization, Build NYC, which mm -hmm. Build NYC can mostly to issue tax exempt bonds for nonprofit organizations. That's the vast majority of 
the um, the bond transactions that exist today. The IDA right now only uh, does um, occasionally refinancings of certain bonds that were historically issued, not necessarily brand new bond transactions. Sure, that makes sense. So um, first of all, Ms. Brown, does that, I'm looking at your face and trying to discern, does that explain the decrease over time? I mean, are you surprised to hear that answer or is that what you expected to no, hear? We, no, I knew that answer. Um, the, the, the projects that we're talking about here are not buying financing projects. They're- oh, okay. The so it's a different, it's a different benefit. It's um, it's a benefit through the property tax, mortgage revenue tax, and sales tax incentives. So um, none, none of these projects, some of them maybe early on, we know that some of the projects early in the life of the program sort of what they call said converted to this sort of non-financing, bond financing projects, which is what we are looking at. Um, but the, you know, besides those, none of the projects um, in our in our study were bond financing projects at all. Thank you. Straight transaction. Thank you both for your patience educating me on this. I really appreciate it. Very interesting conversation. Thank you. Back to you, Chair Drum. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me just ask some questions now of uh, EDC. I know you mentioned previously a little bit about the application process and who applies, but can you just uh, inform us about, you know, walk us through the application process and uh, is there any assistance provided by staff um, and the average uh, processing time for an application. And, um, and then I'll, just that for now, and then I'll, I'll ask the follow up. Um, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so yeah, thank you. And yeah, happy to, I guess, walk through it um, in some more detail. So, uh, Essentially, the beginning of the process starts with a conversation with either the company or a representative of the company to understand, uh, you know, what are they trying to do? And is it something that meets the basic uh, criteria for the EPA? Um, so our basic criteria are a, a capital investment amount. So a project needs to be investing at least a million dollars in actual improvements to a building. So not just buying a building, but actually investing in a building or buying machinery and equipment. Um, so there's a minimum investment threshold. Um, we also look at what we call the inducement arguments. So understanding whether a project genuinely could not move forward without receiving IDA incentives. Um, and then also, you know, the basic question of, is this an industrial company or project or not? Um, so as part of our initial vetting, we determine, you know, we evaluate projects on that basis. Once we come to the conclusion that we do actually want to move forward with this project, we send them the application materials. I will say that, um, that the application for the IDA program is something which is a lot more extensive than applications for any of the as of right programs. Um, so to one of your questions, for all of our projects, we have what we call a project manager who works with the individual company to help them with uh, both with any questions that they have about the application, as well as um, navigating the, the project through our internal due diligence process. So once the project submits the application, we obviously review it to make sure that the information that they filled out um, meets, you know, is comprehensive and uh, that they've uh, given us all of the information that we need. Um, you know, to give you a sense of what it is in terms of the information, so we asked for information about current and projected number of employees, current and projected wages um, on average for the employees that both work at the company um, today, as well as, you know, um, will work at the company once they move forward with the projects, information about the project itself, location, amount of product, uh, amount of investment, things like that. We also look at what is the environmental impact to the day from the project, we do a cost benefit analysis to make sure that the value to the city of the investment that this company is making is more than what we are spending in tax dollars, um, as well as, um, you know, doing a background check and that sort of thing around the company. So that is all part of the application process. Um, it usually takes about six to eight weeks um, from when an application is submitted to when it is ultimately able to be presented to the IDA Board of Directors for um, their review and uh, potentially approval.
Okay, and can you tell us the, um, the number um, of how many applications were received, approved, and rejected in 2020? Uh, so I can follow up with that information. I don't have it uh, with me a second, but I will say that uh, the way that we look at it um, may be a little bit differently from the way that you asked the question. So projects that ultimately submit um, applications are ones that we have determined are ones that we are want to support and are likely to eventually receive approval from the IDA board. We do have projects that submit applications, but then do not move forward with board approval. Those are necessarily projects that have been rejected per se, but projects where, for example, the company has realized that the project is more expensive than they thought, so they need more time to, uh, to find financing for the project or projects where the company was trying to buy a building, but then they weren't able to move forward with buying the building or the, you know, the owner sold it to someone else. So those are, um, and we can, you know, send you the numbers, but essentially um, those are, again, not necessarily rejected projects, but projects where the applicant has realized that they want to move forward with the, the transaction. Okay, so you're like basically saying they're not actually turned away, but there are circumstances that contribute to them not moving forward. Correct, correct. Um, uh, let's talk a little bit about monitoring compliance. According to EDC's fiscal 2020 annual investment projects report, beneficiaries, beneficiaries of NYCIDA agreements must submit employment and benefits reports each year, and EDC staff perform site visits and conduct other follow-up activities to mentor compliance. Uh, how often are site visits conducted on active projects? Uh, yeah, so obviously, um, you know, it has been different during the pandemic, but in general, our uh, goal is to uh, visit all of our projects, um, or at least a 25 or so percent of, 25 to 30 percent of our projects in any given year. Um, and so that's in terms of site visits, but in addition to actually, you know, physically going to a location, we have ongoing conversations and um, you know, uh, coordination with a company throughout the entire process. And that happens on a, you know, not just an annual basis, but sometimes even more frequently than that. So, so when you do the site visits, what measures is um, uh, IDA looking for when you go there? Are you specifically looking for certain things? Sure. So, um, yeah, site visits, um, we do, uh, site visits are um, especially frequent when a project is actually going through their construction um, process. So for, you know, for all of our um, projects, they're doing some type of capital expenditure, building a new building or renovating a building. We do site visits to make sure that they are actually on target when they're supposed to complete that project. Um, for all of our projects, there's a specific deadline by which they need to finish their, um, their projects. So we do site visits to um, confirm track with their um, with their um, construction projects. We also do ongoing monitoring to make sure that they are actually operating the company, the, you know, the business and the way that they've represented to us. You know, if it's a manufacturing company that's making, you know, HVAC equipment, going there to make sure that they're actually doing that. Um, so those are some of the, the, you know, the key things that we uh, look for side visits. And, and what happens if they, you find that they're not in compliance with them, um, what you know, with what they're saying they're doing are there any steps taken to address that? Sure. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. So, um, you know, the the first, um, you know, you know, step is to make them aware that they are not in compliance. Uh, um, sometimes, you know, when it comes to um, to construction projects, you know, there are extenuating circumstances when it comes to delays in construction. So, our first step is to both make them aware that they're not in compliance, but also to better understand. If they are not in compliance, why that has happened? Um, you know, for projects that are particularly egregious in terms of, uh, you know, either not making us aware of what's going on, not operating the comp the business in the way that they have committed to, um, having you know, you know, not moving forward with the construction as anticipated, um, we do move forward with enforcement action. Uh, so that's everything from. 
um, issuing an event of default to actually moving forward with either terminating the agreement or seeking a recapture of the benefits that we've provided. And council member, just to put a finer point on that, for every project we find non-compliant, we send a report to council on a bi-monthly basis that details um, the, the instance of non-compliance and our um, methods and measures to re, um, find recourse in that. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Yeah, I'm aware a little bit of that. Um, and let me just say on recapture, uh, IBO's preliminary findings indicated that from 2002 to 2019, the recapture amount totaled 21.6 million with nearly 20% of projects having had benefits recaptured. So what is the process of recapturing uh, benefits and how long does it take to collect such benefits? Um, in the instance where we find that a business is not living up to um, their agreement, we have to, once we realize that we have to actually recapture those benefits, we refer those cases to the law department um, and they will work with the businesses on the recapture. So unfortunately we can't speak to the details of like how the law department does that process, but those cases are referred over. Okay, thank you. And uh, let me ask about the MOU, the MOU. <laughs> uh, the council passed local law 18 of 2017, which mandates annual evaluations of city economic development tax expenditure programs from IBO. Some programs subject to review would require information from New York City Economic Development Corps and they would uh, be required to share the necessary information with IBO pursuant to both LL18 and the city's charter. However, um, Economic Development Corps expressed that some of this information could compromise the privacy of its clients and hamper its ability to maintain a positive relationship with its partners. If the council's understanding uh, that uh, there is an MOU in progress between IBO and EDC uh, to work out terms that would both protect the privacy of um, EDC's clients and permit IBO sufficient information to conduct uh, the mandated review. So is there anything holding up the finalization of the MOU and uh, what's the status of the discussions with IBO at this point? Sure, so um, thank you for that question. In 2017, we tried to come to an agreement um, on an MOU and kind of as EDC determined that we will trust the IBO, um, that they will handle the sensitive data that we are remitting over to them um, and keep it confidential to protect our clients' um, tax secrecy data and proprietary information. So we are no longer pursuing the IBO. We are trust. We are no longer pursuing, sorry, the MOU. We are trusting that the IBO can handle the data in a confidential um, way as they've done with this report. So we have no, no concerns there. And IBO, you're good with that? Uh, it's working at the moment, so. Okay, all right, good. All right, so you know what? We have some um, uh, uh, testimony from the public, so I think uh, I'm gonna stop with the questions here. There, I don't believe there are any further council member questions. Okay, uh, I wanna thank you. Of course, we have some follow-up questions. We'll be writing to you both, uh, but I do wanna thank you for your time, uh, Mr. Sweeting and Ms. Brown, uh, Mr. Uh, Omolare, I'm sorry for messing up your name, uh, and also to Ms. Singletary as well. Thank you for being here with us today. And now we're going to move to the next section of the hearing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Council, do you want to call the witnesses? Yes. Um, we will now turn to testimony from members of the public who have signed up to testify. I would like to remind everyone that unlike our in-person council hearings, we'll be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Once your name is called, a member of our staff will meet you and the Sergeant at Arms will set a timer and announce that you may begin. Your testimony will be limited to three minutes. I would like to welcome first Quincy L. Kate, followed by Brian T. Coleman. Mr. L. Kate, uh, you can begin when ready. Time starts now. All right. Um, good morning. My name's Quincy Ely Kate. I'm Director of Industrial Business Development at the Business Outreach Center Network and the Masbeth Industrial Business Association. We're a nonprofit economic development organization that proudly supports industrial and manufacturing businesses, jobs, and workers across six industrial business zones in Central Queens and East Brooklyn, including the IBZs of Ridgewood, Masbeth, Steinway, Woodside, East New York, and the Flatlands Fairfield IBZ. We also work as part of the Equitable Industrial Development Initiative with the Mayor's Office of MWBE, which works to catalyze worker cooperative conversions in the industrial sector. 
The importance of a strong industrial manufacturing sector is clear now more than ever as we face this pandemic. Industrial businesses have been instrumental in keeping New York breathing and moving by supporting our local food supplies, manufacturing, distributing PPE, and maintaining other critical components of our economic infrastructure. Additionally, the industrial manufacturing sectors employ a majority immigrant and minority workforce who have not had access to higher education while paying an average salary of over 60,000, twice the amount of the average salary in the service industries. We work closely with the IDA to identify businesses and projects with both a need for investment and where an investment preserves and catalyzes considerable economic impacts in return for the city. IDA incentives create jobs, support an equitable workforce and strengthen our local economy. Without the IDA incentive, incentives, many of the businesses we work with would not be, simply would not be able to remain in New York City, including DNJ Industries, which we had worked with for an HVAC design and fabricator, who we worked with for years to try to identify space. They were continually outbid by speculative developers in the IBZ, self-storage developers. Um, ultimately, with the IDA, we were able to find them a space and, and they have been able to preserve 80 jobs in the, in the area. Other, other projects are the weapons specialists in Ridgewood, High Tech Metals in Maspeth, Phoenix Building Supply, Mind Hand Company in Ridgewood. Um, in total, uh, over a thousand jobs um, just with businesses that we have been support, that we work with that have been supported by the IDA. Um, these investments are not only about jobs, they're also about equity. And this moment has demonstrated the value of uh, the industrial manufacturing sector. And it's more important than ever that the IDA can continue. Um, I'd like to thank their team. They've always worked with us as we're on the ground looking for you know, different ways to support industrial manufacturing businesses, even indulging us on trying to figure out how to make worker cooperatives uh, part of this equation and how to help them access these incentives as well. So thank you for your time and thank you to the IDA. That's good, and um, I hear you on the work cooperatives. That's great. I think we have another witness, and then there may be a question or two after that. So let's go to the next witness, and then we'll ask questions of both witnesses. Now we'll have to hear from Brian T. Coleman. Time starts now. Mr. Coleman, are you there? Oh, I'm, so, I'm sorry. I, I am here. I apologize. I, I lost okay. for a moment. Um, thank you for uh, thank you for having me here today. Um, my name is Brian Coleman. I have the pleasure of serving as the CEO of the Greenpoint Manufacturing Design Center. Um, we're New York City's leading nonprofit industrial developer. Since 1998, GMD's completed four of its seven development projects, over 300,000 square feet, with IDA's assistance. Over the last two decades, the cost of acquiring industrial space has increased by almost 200% due to various reasons, including conversions, both legal and illegal, rezonings, competition from big box retailers, mini storage operators, uh, and even hotels. A couple ever-escalating acquisition costs are some of the most expensive construction costs in the country, as well as ever-increasing operating expenses, and you create an environment that is almost impossible to operate in. The programs, policies, and benefits of the New York City IDA help to ensure that our projects are possible. Through a straightforward, consistent, and efficient application and review and approval process, we know that our IDA benefits were in place even before we close on the purchase of one of our prospective developments. There are two specific IDA programs that GMDC's projects rely on, the sales tax exemption benefit and the pilot program, the program that exempts projects from real estate taxes for a defined period. Um, I'll refer to our most recent projects. Uh, last year, we opened uh, our biggest project to date, a $42 million project with $15 million worth of construction on 95th Avenue in Ozone Park, Queens. 
Um, we were fortunate um, combined through the sales tax and the pilot program to receive just over $1.7 million in benefits. Our previous project at 1102 Atlantic Avenue in Crown Heights, we received just over $1.1 million in combined benefits. These make our projects work, these benefits. Um, the benefits provided by the New York City IDA are significant. I would say essential to the development and ongoing operation of our projects. The New York City IDA is not another city agency in our opinion. We consider the IDA a partner in the successes we've had that in our last four developments over the last 20 years. Undoubtedly, the development um, have, wouldn't have taken place without the projects. Um, so. What, what does this mean at the end of the day? The average salary of one of our buildings, of one of the workers is $56,000. 92% of the workers in our building are New York City residents, 97% are state residents. 40% um, of the people work in our building speak English as a second language. 30% of the businesses who operate in our buildings are MWBEs. I, I'm talking to you mostly about the past, but I want to talk quickly about a new project that we're undertaking with IDA's assistance. With the bridge, a well-known, respected, supportive, affordable housing developer, GMDC is embarking on the first of its kind project in the city of New York. And once again, the New York City IDA is offering its programs and support. We will be developing 40,000 square feet of industrial space coupled for the first time with 170 units of supportive and affordable housing. Not only did the project recently complete Euler process, but we also have just recently been given preliminary approval from the IDA for a benefit package that will help ensure the project's success. We look forward to working with the city and IDA and hope to communicate more to the council about this project as we move forward. Thank you for your time and consideration, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. What council member's district was that in, or is that in? Uh, it, the, the new project is in Council and Barron's district. Oh, okay, great. And she's very, very strict Yours. on that. So uh, that's great. Uh, she <laughs> is. I mean, we spent we spent two years plus vetting the product with her um, and her, her staff and the community board. And we're, like I said, we're very, very happy just to complete the Euler process um, with really overall support from, uh, from all the entities along the way, both the uh, borough president's office, the community board, and finally, um, the city planning commission itself. That's great. Uh, for both of you, how did you hear about the program? Well, we're an economic development entity. So, I mean, we work closely with the New York City Economic Development Corporation. We work closely with IDA. As I said, we've done four projects over the last 20 years. So um, I don't want to say we're pros at it, but we're familiar with the program, um, its workings, and we know the importance of it, quite honestly, as I mentioned, to our bottom line. So um, we do generally, generally consider our work with IDA and EDC as a partnership um, and to allow us to uh, do these very complex projects. And thank Mr. Ely Kate, yeah. Yes, so we are, um, our organization is industrial business service providers. So we work uh, with the city, uh, basically a contract with SBS to provide access to resources, incentives for industrial manufacturing businesses. So, and this is the IDA's programs are the most powerful economic development incentives available for, for these businesses. So we are pretty steeped in trying to help businesses navigate um, these types of programs. And again, for both of you, uh, how did you find the application process? Um, burdensome, um, were they helpful? Uh, what was the process like for you going through that? Um, I can speak on GMD, GMDC's behalf. Um, we think it's a straightforward process. I mean, we're assigned a project manager. They require certain information of us. Um, uh, the lines of communication are open. Um, it's not a process that um, we find that is burdensome or troublesome uh, in any way. You know, I think it, it really depends on the project. Um, some projects just, I think, clearly meet all the, the guidelines of the program. Other projects, there it might be more gray, um, and so you know we would reach out to Krishna and his team to see, you know, if they would qualify. What other uh, ways could they potentially be included in the program? Um, you know, worker cooperatives. I think I mentioned that you know there's some challenges uh, that they would be eligible, but just I think meeting some of the thresholds for investment, they might not have access to financing to to 
to be part of those programs. So, you know, it really depends on each case, but um, yeah, at least for Krishna's team, they make it very clear on how we can move forward. I think you're on mute. <laughs> Thank you. That's good. And I'm really glad to hear that the relationship exists there, that uh, IDA has been helpful and supportive of, of, of your applications. So we hope that that continues. All right. I think that's it. Council, do we have anybody else to give testimony? No, that's everyone that's signed up. And, and no further questions? No, no chair. Okay. So I want to thank everybody for coming in today. This has been a very informative and I think productive hearing and um, I'm just most grateful to everybody. Thanks to the staff also that prepped me uh, and partially prepped me on the way back during the snowstorm from New York City yesterday where I got my COVID vaccine. Yay, finally. And uh, <laughs> glad to be alive, right? Um, but anyway, I thank everybody for coming. And with that, this hearing is adjourned at 1156 a.